Morning, everyone. Thank you for getting up early to uh, come to this session. I appreciate you, appreciate you doing that. I hope everyone's wide awake. <clears throat> so I was going to be talking this morning about entity relationships in a document database, but um, I first want to take a step back and make an assumption. And that assumption is that you've already done an analysis phase and decided that a document database is the right fit for your, your project. Um, in case you haven't done that, I've got to just want to talk about that really briefly. So when would you choose a document database, like uh, CouchDB or, or uh, MongoDB? So let's say you're using a relational database, um, but you've been using denormalization to increase performance, to increase read performance specifically. So that might be a situation where if you're heavily relying on denormalization, you might go all the way to denormalizing to, to documents. So you're okay, another scenario would be that you're okay giving up consistency in exchange for concurrency. So high level concurrency, but trading off consistency in exchange for that concurrency. And just generally speaking, your data model is a good fit for, for documents. So for example, a content management system where every, every entry might have very different metadata. So that might be an example where a document database is a good fit. Okay, uh, so when not to choose a document database? So SQL is a very powerful and mature language for working with relational data sets. So if you truly have very re highly relational data, you might want to stick with an SQL database. If consistency is critical to your application, you might want to stick with a relational database. Um, and you haven't, you haven't bothered exploring scalability options for your current database. So likely there are a bunch of options out there and things you can research with your existing database. So check those out first before just jumping on the bandwagon with a document database. So this presentation, again, like I said, assumes that you've already gone through this analysis phase and decided that a document database is a good fit for your application. Uh, however, just because you're using a document database doesn't mean that you're not gonna have any relationships. So you still have to model entity relationships. You're likely not going to get away with just having no relationships at all in your application. So uh, when those scenarios come up, how do we deal with that? So I'm gonna be talking specifically, uh, the, the examples I'm gonna be talking about here are going to be for CouchDB uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one is that, um, that it's what I'm familiar with. I've written a couple of books on CouchDB, uh, which I'll talk about uh, at the end. Um, the other reason being that um, MongoDB has um, a more expressive query language, so you can actually do a lot of querying um, in MongoDB, uh, whereas in CouchDB you have to use these techniques in order to get um, related data. So um, the other reason is that there's actually a really great, I'll be talking about this as well, um, for, both for both CouchDB and MongoDB, there's a uh, doctrine object document mapper, um, which will actually handle a lot of these relationships for you, which I'll, I'll go over briefly a little bit later. So the examples I'm gonna be using here uh, use uh, MapReduce, or incremental MapReduce in CouchDB. So who's heard of MapReduce before? Cool. So basically, um, put this humorous slide up here for you. I don't know if you can read it okay, but. Um, so MapReduce at first can be a little puzzling. What the heck are we talking about? Um, so don't worry, we don't have to write MapReduce functions in Erlang. We can write them in JavaScript, so it's not quite as scary. And they don't have to be distributed, so it's not quite as scary as this, uh, as this um, slide leads, leads us to believe. So the idea is that we're going to incrementally pass every single document in our database through a map function. And that map, map function will transform data in that document into zero, one, or more rows in an index, in a B-tree index. So we are, we're mapping data, transforming data from documents into a B-tree index. Um, we could also optionally have a reduce step where we take that data and reduce it down to a single scalar value. Um, you can also reduce based on groups. You can do group level, levels, stuff like that as well with reduce. So on uh, this presentation, we're gonna be talking about, um, uh, we're gonna be using an example entity relationship. So here's a entity relationship diagram. You might have seen something like this before. So basically this example we'll be looking at, we've got a publishers, books, and authors. Uh, publishers can have multiple books. A book can only have one publisher. Books can have many authors. Authors can have many books. Publishers have an ID field, which identifies the publisher, as well as a name. Books have an ID and a title. Author has an ID and a name. 
Now, a better model would probably be first name and last name, but I'm just trying to keep things simple here to keep the, to keep the example simple. So the way we're gonna do this uh, is we're actually going to use uh, in, a, in a relational database, because I'm gonna use that as a reference point because that's likely where most of you are coming from. With a relational database, you're gonna use joins to, to get related data. In a database like CouchDB, you're gonna use collation, basically sorting, to, uh, to do joins. So it's the equivalent of joins. So with a join, you have a left side and a right side, a relationship. With collation, you have a top and a bottom side. So let's t first take a look at what a query might look like in SQL. So here we're selecting uh, data for both publishers and books. We're getting the idea of a publisher, name and title. We're doing a full outer join on books. So um, you don't have to do a full outer join for these examples. You could just do, um, you could just do a left outer, regular left outer join. Um, technically they're different. Technically the equivalent of what we'll be seeing with the MapReduce examples is a, is a full outer join, but it doesn't matter for the purposes of this, this, this presentation. So if you're, my, my SQL, I believe, it doesn't support full outer joins. So you can just do a left outer join and these examples will all work the same. These particular examples, at least. So this is what it uh, might look like for querying that data. We get those three columns we selected on, publisher ID, publisher name, and the book title. So again, left and right side of the relationship. Left side being the publisher, right side being the books. So, makes sense so far, pretty straightforward, cool. Now what would this look like in CouchDB if we were querying this data? So um, we would have collated result set. So we'll have, um, what we'll do instead of a left and right, we'll have the publisher first uh, with the, all of the books from that publisher listed after it. So what we're doing here is we're using the way that uh, the rows get sorted in our index in order to, to take advantage of this. So, we're using a compound key with uh, the first part of the compound key. The compound key is basically just a JSON array. The first element in the, in the array is the, name, is the identifier for the publisher. Second element is either a zero or a one. So what happens is the publishers get a zero and the books get a one. So what happens is by the first, first part of the compound key being the same, all of the publishers and books from that publisher sort together or group together effectively. And then by using a zero for the publisher and a one for the books, we make sure that the publisher row always shows up first before it's related books. So we can see instead of left and right, we've got top and bottom. <clears throat> so the, key, the dif key differences here is these are in separate rows, aren't joined together into a single row. So we'll see that the view result sets are made up of columns and rows, but again, difference with the relational database is that every row is gonna have the exact same three columns, key, ID, and value. And unlike in a relational database, each column can contain a mixture of logical data types. So there are actually might be different data types uh, within, a, within a particular column. That would never happen in a, in a relational database. So let's look at uh, how we might model a one-to-many relationship. So simplest pattern for modeling a one-to-many relationship is to use embedded entities. So basically, we're just gonna relest, uh, nest related entities within a document. So we have a single re document representing the, the one entity, uh, nested entities, basically just a JSON array, representing the many entities. And like I said, this is just the simplest approach. So what's this look like in a document? We've got a JSON do um, object here, which is our document, ID of O'Reilly, collection of publisher. Um, in MongoDB, MongoDB has a concept of collections, CouchDB, um, doesn't have a concept of collections. This is just a field I'm using to make my, my map functions uh, easier to write so I can identify which, what type of document it is. Uh, name, and then I just have the books nested within it. So just a list of books just nested right in there. So that's pretty straightforward. How would we uh, query that data? So here's our map function. So the first thing that map function gets is the doc document passed into it. Again, if this were, if you're doing a map reduce in Mongo, I believe it actually uses this instead of doc. So the syntax would be a little bit different. Uh, if the publisher, if it's the publisher collection, we emit the ID of the publisher and is zero, so we get the publisher row first. We loop through all the books, emit the ID of the publisher and a one, so that then the books for a publisher will sort after 
the publisher. And here's the output, which is the same as what we just saw a minute ago. So limitations of this approach. So if you have a large number of related entities, this isn't, this isn't gonna work. So how many books do you think O'Reilly publishes? Thousands, probably, who knows? Um, so that's not gonna work. Um, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have very, really large documents. It's gonna be slow to, to update those documents, to get data from those documents and then do updates on them. Be unwieldy to modify it. Um, you're gonna have document update conflicts, likely. And it's gonna be, take a long time to index it. So let's take a look at another approach we could use. So that's fine if you have a limited number of, of, of um, entities on the many side, but here's a little bit better approach if you have a lot more relationships or entities related. We can use the related documents pattern where we reference the entity by its identifier. So we have one document representing the one, a single document representing the one entity, separate documents for each many entity, and each many entity references its one entity by the one entity's document identifier. So this makes for smaller documents and also reduces the probability of document update conflicts. Because we've, we've now denormalized, we've, well not denormalized, we've um, separated this out into, into separate documents. So the likelihood of a document update conflict decreases. So here's an example of a document. So we've got a publisher with um, collection publisher name O'Reilly Media. We've got a book. And the key here is that we have a publisher field that references back to that, that publisher, O'Reilly. So how would we go about mapping that? Okay, let's take a look. We've got our map function, gets past our document to map, so this is getting run for every single document in our database incrementally. If it's a publisher document, we're gonna emit the ID of the publisher and a zero for the key. Second parameter is the value, the name of the publisher. If it's a book, we're going to emit the publisher's ID, so those will match, so the top and the bottom IDs will match, but a one so that the, so that the books for that publisher will sort after it. And the result of that is very similar to what we saw a minute ago, uh, except that the ID field's different because these were emitted from different documents versus all being emitted from the same document. Any questions so far? Make sense? So what are the limitations of this approach? So if you're getting an entity on the right side of the relationship, you can't include any data from the left side of the relationship without user doing an additional query. Um, it only works for one to many relationships. Many to many relationships you can't do. So let's look at how we would do many to many relationships. So there's a couple of patterns we can use here. First one is list of keys, where we reference entities by their identifiers. So we have a document representing each many entity on the left side of the relationship, separate documents for each many entity on the right side of the relationship, and each many entity on the right side of the relationship has a list of, of identifiers for its many entities on the left side of the relationship. So what's this look like? So if we're gonna wanna query for books and related authors, here's what our document structures might look like. So we have a book. Uh, the book has no related data in it, just the ISBN for the ID, book collection and the title of the book. Again, another book. So we've got three books here, all with different ISBNs. And now here's the author. This particular author only has one book, but we still put it in an array because they could have many, many books. So, so Leonard Mueller has authored this, a book by that ISBN. Uh, Norman Walsh, though, has authored three books. So he's authored those three books with those ISBNs. So let's map it. Here's our map function. Again, just like always, we get our doc document passed in. If that document belongs to the book collection, we emit the ID of the book and a zero as the key and the title of the book as the value. If it's an author, instead, we loop through all of the books by that author in that author document. And for each of those books, we're gonna emit the ID of the, of the book and a one so that the, we get the book row first and then the authors from that book sorted after it. And then uh, one, and the one lets us do that, lets us make sure that those get sorted uh, after the books. And then we omit the name of the, the author. 
So here's what this looks like. So we've got our book row and then a um, list of authors after each book. So Doc Book 5 Definitive Guide has one author, Making Text Work has one author, Doc Book the Definitive Guide um, has two authors. <clears throat> what if we want to go the other way around? What if we want to, instead of, creating, uh, instead of querying books and related authors, we want to query for authors and related books? So we can do that with the existing data structure, uh, with some limitations though, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So we can actually leave our data structure just like it is, but we only care about author entities in this case. So we're only going to get authors. If it's an author, we're going to emit the ID of the author, which is basically just, in this example, it's just the last name of the author, and it's zero. Then we're going to loop through all the books for that author, and for each of those books, we're going to emit the ID of the, of the author, in this case. So we're emitting the author ID and a one to get those authors to sort after the, uh, the books to sort after the authors. Now for the value though, we're doing something interesting here. So for the value, what we're doing is we're emitting a JSON object with an underscore ID uh, key and the ID of the, of the uh, particular book. So what this does, uh, CouchDB actually has a feature called include docs, which by default will actually go get the full document for you uh, for the document from which the row was emitted. But if you pass it, if you use this syntax, if you pass it this underscore ID um, object with an underscore ID in it, what it will do instead of including the document from which the emit was called, it will actually include the reference document for you. So let's see this first without, uh, without include docs on. So without include docs on, we can get the author and all of their books, but we can't get any data from the books. So all we can get is the ID of each book. So we don't get any, any data from those. So we'd have to do a separate query to get data from books here. But if we, if we turn on include docs, we can now get the entire document for each, um, for each of these books. Now there is a slight performance penalty for this because under the hood it's actually going to do a separate query. So it is doing an additional query to go get these, these documents. Um, because all the, all the examples that we've seen so far are just hitting the B-tree index directly and getting everything directly out of the B-tree index, so extremely efficient. But what if you do include docs, it has to go outside the B-tree index to retrieve the, the document. So there's gonna be a performance penalty to this. Um, not a huge performance penalty, but uh, just something to be aware of. <clears throat> now a better model, if, we, if that wasn't okay, we could just reverse the references. We could just design our documents the other way around. So we could get rid of the book references from authors. So all our authors are just the authors now without any books listed. And instead of listing the um, books for the authors for each, uh, sorry, the books for each author, we're gonna list the authors for each book. And here's a book with multiple authors. Let's map it. If it's an author, we're going to um, emit the document ID of the author in a zero for the value. And if it's a book, we're gonna loop through all the authors for that book, emit the ID of the author, and a one. So here we go. Now we've gotten, now we're able to get a list of authors and their books without the performance penalty of the additional, of the additional query for include docs. We can get right out of the B tree index now. So limitations of this are that um, what I just talked about with uh, you can only get data from one side or the other, depending on how you've designed your documents, unless you're using include docs. Now, if you have a lot of relationships, this still could get unwieldy. It's a lot better than what we saw before where we're, in, we're embedding the entire other entities. But if you have a ton of relationships, you might have a huge list of keys. So that could get, that, if it's a really big, large number of relationships, you might wanna look at a different approach and that approach is uh, the relationship documents approach. So here we're gonna create a document to represent each individual relationship. So this is um, similar sort of conceptually to a junction table in a relational database. So with this approach we have a document representing each um, many entity on the left side of the relationship, same thing with the right, right side of the relationship. Um, we don't store any references to either though. The left side doesn't store any, any 
references to the right, and the right side doesn't store any references to the left. What we do instead is for each distinct relationship, we're gonna have a separate relationship document. So we're gonna have a lot of these probably. So if we look at our example entities, our books have no references to authors. So each of these books that we look at, no, no authors listed in them. If we look at our authors, we can see that we have no books listed in our authors. What we do instead though, is we create these, these relationship documents. So each relationship document basically just connects the book to the author. So this book written by this author. Um, the idea of just, um, in CouchDB we'll use GUIDs automatically, I've just shortened that here um, to make it uh, easier to read, or so really so it fits on the slide. So that's one relationship. Another relationship. Another relationship. So we see we have a lot of these relationship documents. We're mapping each, each book to each author. Okay, so we've got those relationship documents. Let's look at uh, one query we might want to do with that. We might want to query for books and related authors using relationship documents. How would we do that? Here's our map function. We've got our document. If our document's a book, we're gonna emit the ID of the book and a zero to get the books first. This lets us get data from the books in our, at least in our, our header rows. And if it's a book author, we emit the ID of the book and a one. So exact same principle we've been using all along, where we're using these compound keys and collation uh, to get books first and then authors for that book after it. Um, difference here though is that we can't get any, any data from book authors. We can only get the ID of the author. We can't get any other data about authors. But we can use that underscore ID um, trick to use include docs if we want. So here's the output of that. We've got the books and data for each book and a list of authors for each book. Turn on include docs, we've got our data for all of our authors now. Um, note that with these include, with the docs I've truncated those, as you can see there, so it's not the full document because it wouldn't fit on the slides. Let's go the other direction. Instead of getting books and related authors, let's get authors and related books. If it's an author, we're gonna emit the ID of the author in a zero, along, along with the name of the author. If it's a book author, in other words, a relationship document, then we're gonna emit the ID of the author in a one, and again, using that special underscore ID syntax. So here we go, here's our result set, authors, and then for each author, list of related books. Turn on include docs, we've got data for both now. Right, any questions? Making sense so far? Cool. Uh, limitations. So we can only include data from either the left or the right side of the relationship depending on which, which map function we go with, which, which one we're, we're querying against without using include docs. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work to um, maintain these relationship documents because you're gonna have a lot of them so there's some overhead in, in maintaining those. Okay, I said I wanted to look at um, the object document mapper in Doctrine. Um, this is actually a pretty cool um, feature. Does anybody here use, who uses Doctrine? Anybody? Cool, not very many, awesome. I was, I was expecting more, but um, Doctrine's pretty cool, but they've also got this, Doctrine's typically used as an object relational mapper for relational databases, but they also have this object document mapper feature. And what this does, this allows you to, to uh, map uh, uh, documents in your in your da uh, database to um, PHP objects. So you can actually instantiate your objects from these, mapping these directly, and it will do that work for you. So first I wanna look at uh, Doctrine CouchDB. So features of Doctrine CouchDB includes um, client library and an ODM. So it's actually really, if you're using CouchDB, the client library in Doctrine ODM is actually pretty nice. Uh, sorry, the Doctrine CouchDB ODM. Um, you can actually use Doctrine's persistent semantics here. So you can reuse a lot, if you use Doctrine already, you can reuse a lot of your knowledge about how Doctrine works. 
And like I said, it maps CouchDB views. You, oh, sorry, it also maps CouchDB views to PHP objects. So not just individual documents, you can also map views, the output of views to objects. Sports document conflict resolution as well. So <clears throat> it also has some uh, optimization stuff. It has a right behind feature. Well, basically, what it'll do is it will store in memory um, document changes and batch process them all, them all at once for performance benefits. Optionally, you don't have to use that feature if you don't want. So um, here's some examples. This is actually from their, from their documentation. So here's an example of a blog post entity. We're using uh, annotations to, to uh, use Doctrine's persistent semantics here. So we've got a at document. So we're indicating blog post as a document. We've got our ID field. We've got a couple of string fields. And we've got a date time field. So Doctrine now, with that metadata, Doctrine now can take care of, of saving and retrieving these entities for us from the database. So how do we persist entity? We create a new blog post, set, call, uh, set some data on it, um, and then we persist it, and then we flush it. So persisting it basically effectively queues it up to be saved. It doesn't actually go ahead and save it right away, and then the flush will go ahead and actually send to the database um, everything that's been persisted up to that point. Oh. Any questions so far on this? Let's say we want to get an entity out of the database. Here's an example of finding an entity. We tell it the um, class that the entity belongs to and the UUID, and we use the uh, document manager, a document manager instance to do this. Uh, I told you I also wanted to look at uh, Doctrine's Mongo ODM, because I'm sure some of you also use, use uh, MongoDB. Uh, the semantics are actually pretty much the same. Uh, features, same, feature, same features as the CouchDB one. Maps documents using Doctrine's persistent semantics. You can map embedded documents, so when we saw um, the idea of embedding entities within an entity, you can actually map that um, in here. You know, actually, Do Doctrine will actually take care of that for you. Same thing with, with reference documents. So a lot of these things that I've talked about, you can do automatically with, with um, the doc, object document mapper. It does batch inserts for performance, and it will do atomic updates. So let's take a look at an example of an entity. This is also from the, from the documentation, the introduction. So um, if you want more, you can go just check out the documentation for, for this, for this um, ODM. But so we create a base employee, um, call it a mapped superclass. Because what we're going to do is we're actually going to, since it's an abstract class, we're going to create specific types of employees. Uh, set an ID. And we can see here's an example of an embedded document. We use the embed one uh, annotation for address there. So that's actually going to embed the address directly in the document. Here's an employee uh, entity. We indicate that it's a document. Um, and it has a reference. So that here's an example of a reference where we're actually linking to another document. Uh, we tell what target document it is. This, so the manager is uh, t of type manager. So um, here's a, here's a um, manager. Manager can have multiple projects. So here's a reference many. So here's an example of a one-to-many relationship using Doctrine's um, ODM. So we're saying that um, there can be many projects for each manager can have many projects. It'll reference those target documents for us. Address, pretty straightforward. You'll see the address is an example of an embedded document. So this is meant to be embedded within another, within another docu document. And projects. Very straightforward, have IDs, has an ID and a name. So let's see how we'd work with that. So we can create a new employee instance, set the name, set the salary, set start when they started, so set up our, our data for the employee. Uh, let's give the employee an address. So setting the address for the employee, see the very last line, we, we assign this address uh, object to the employee. Uh, here's a project. Let's give a manager a project. 
and see the last line we're adding the project to the manager. So we've got, here's a bunch of relationships we're, we're doing right in, in PHP, we're setting up these relationships. And then the MongoDB document mapper, document manager will actually let us persist these. So we can persist to all these entities. And then when we call flush, it will actually write it to the database. And if we want to get a specific entity back out, we can use the find method to get the manager, a manager, for example, by the manager's ID. We use the document manager instance to do this. Great, any questions on that? Cool. So some additional things I want to talk about. Uh, I want to um, go back to uh, talk a little bit about comparing relational databases to document databases. So obviously document databases have no tables, so obviously no columns either. Um, at least with CouchDB, you're always querying um, a view or an index directly. So you're not, indexes aren't being used to optimize more generalized queries. Um, you're, you're actually querying directly against the, the index or a view in CouchDB. Uh, MongoDB, you can do generalized queries in that, um, although you do want to make sure to index those for performance reasons. Uh, like I mentioned before, you can, um, a particular column in a result set could have a mix of logical data types. That would never happen in a relational database, part of the theory of how relational databases work. Um, so no built-in concepts of relationships between documents. So where um, it's kind of like, uh, has anybody used MySQL before it had referential integrity and you kind of, you could sort of, you could do joins and stuff, but it didn't actually really know that they were related. Um, it's kind of like that. And then just the different patterns we, we saw, a bunch of ways we can go about relating entities. So caveats, things to be aware of, no referential integrity. Um, no atomic transactions across document boundaries. So you can atomically update a single document, but if that document has relationships to other documents, you can't update those atomically. So um, you could end up with inconsistencies there. So again, this is assuming that you've decided that this is okay because you've already, you've, you've done the analysis phase and decided that, that the trade-off is worth it. Um, we're gonna end up, um, some of these patterns could involve denormalizing data, so storing data redundantly. So again, anytime you denormalize, you're adding additional burden to, um, to keeping that denormalized data up to date and in sync. Um, because there's no referential integrity, because we can't atomically update documents, you're gonna end up with data consistencies, so you need to, need to be able to handle those. You need to be able to handle eventual consistency scenarios where, um, where things won't always be, be consistent with each other. Um, also, uh, CouchDB has a replication feature. So if you're replicating between databases, it's possible that you might have a reference to a document the, then the, the, ref, um, the document containing the reference has been replicated, but the document that it's referencing hasn't been replicated yet. So that's an example of, a, of an eventual consistency issue to be aware of. So re with replication and without having referential integrity, um, you might actually end up referencing things that don't exist yet, in a particular node at least. Uh, some additional techniques you can use. This one's uh, specific to CouchDB. You can um, use the start key and end key parameters. Uh, so for example, if you just wanted to get a book and its, and its authors, you could set the start key to the compound key, the JSON array, uh, starting with the ISBN of the book, and then the end key to the same thing, but uh, with an uh, empty object. That just makes it, effectively all this is doing is giving a, doing a range query between um, all getting us all the books with that, all the entries with that ISBN. So that will effectively get us all the, uh, the book with that ISBN and all the authors from that ISBN. Uh, so this example, I haven't URL encoded this, so this won't work. If you just add this to your query string, you have to make sure you URL encode that. But if I URL encoded it here, you wouldn't be able to read it, so. Um, Okay, um, some other things you can do. 
you might also want to, so I've only showed you map functions, I haven't shown you any reduce functions, but you might also want to use a reduce function, so you can do uh, counts, for example, on number of books for a particular author. Um, you could use grouping levels as well if you want. Grouping levels are, with a compound key, a group level says only look at the first element or second element, uh, first and second, or first, second, and third elements of the compound key. So you can do some neat stuff with that. Uh, with CouchDB, you want, you can assign, you can use natural keys, which I've been using throughout this, this um, talk. So natural keys are certainly easier to read in a presentation like this. For example, we used O'Reilly as the key for the publisher. We used the last name of the author as the key for the author, and the ISBN uh, as the key for books. So those are what we call natural keys. They're, they're natural identifiers for those entities. But for performance reasons, if you're gonna deal with a large amount of data, um, you might want to use auto-generated UUIDs. So um, those are going to get you better performance with a, with a large amount of data. Um, the reason for that is that UUIDs are what's called mostly monotonic. Uh, basically means they're, they're, effect, they're mostly sequential, is what, basically what that means. So they're going to actually, the way the B-tree index works is actually going to be um, better at, or better able to query those effectively with large data sets. Uh, if you're using the relationship documents pattern, uh, you can use CouchDB's bulk document API. So bulk document API, don't, don't be confused, this doesn't actually do a transaction. This is not a transaction. It's just letting you send a whole bunch of stuff to be updated at once. Each document update is still gonna happen atomically by itself, not, not across the transaction. But it can be more performant because you can send the entire request all at once. Uh, I believe MongoDB also has some, some bulk operations as well. Uh, so we saw with the list of keys and relationship documents patterns, uh, sometimes you can only get data from the left side or the right side, depending on which way you've modeled your data. You could decide to denormalize and actually store references in both directions, um, allowing you to get data from both sides without using the include docs trick. But um, this is, of course, denormalization, which results in overhead that you have to maintain, and you have to maintain those relationships. So just here's a helpful cheat sheet. So uh, to help you decide which pattern to use. So we're using a one-to-many or many-to-many. -many. Uh, how many documents, how many relationships are you talking about? So one-to-many, if you're using one-to-many, embedded entities or related documents are a good pattern to use. If you have many-to-many, -many, list of keys and relationship documents will work. If you don't have a ton of relation relations between documents, you can use embedded entities or a list of keys. If you have a lot of relationships, um, related documents or, or relationship documents might be better. So this is a handy cheat sheet, and I'll be um, publishing these slides online as well, so uh, if you wanna check this out. Okay, great. Uh, I mentioned that I've also got um, a couple of books. I've got some discount cones for those books up here if you want, 40% um, off of the print book and 40% off the ebook. Uh, so writing query map reduced views in CouchDB and scaling CouchDB, so hit me up if you want a discount on that. Um, I've got some time for questions, if, if anybody has any questions. Um, I think they want folks to come up to the microphone if you have questions, just so they can, so everybody can hear your, hear your questions, so. Anybody? With the um, use of document databases, are you seeing more people moving entirely from a relational database to a document database, or are you seeing applications which combine two kinds of service? A great question. Yeah, actually, I'm seeing a lot of folks using both, and I think they can actually work really well together, um, depending, because there's different, different needs, and you st still might want to, you might have some stuff like a reporting application where a relational database works really well, um, but where you want, but for, for queries, for, um, stuff that's queried quite often, like at a web application where you have the same query being run over and over and over again, you might want to optimize that with a document database. So, of course, now you've got synchronization issues to, to deal with there, but, um, but yeah, no, it's definitely, a, I wouldn't recommend just picking a single database. I mean, you could definitely use, use the right tool or tools for the job, so, thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? What's it? I know. <laughs> um, also, if, so feel free to hit me up if you have any questions. Um, uh, my Twitter, I'm, I'm on Twitter, it's at Bradley Holt. My blog's bradley-holt.com. Also, if you could please 
Um, give me feedback on the stock, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, join.in slash 7040. Uh, feedback, if you can leave comments, it really helps to, to improve talks in the future. So um, speakers really appreciate that. Um, also, I'll post the slides up as well at that URL. So I'll try to get those up today. Um, sure, there's no other questions? Yep, last call. Okay, awesome, thank you everybody.